Revelation, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Revelation, chapter 20. Revelation, chapter 20, verse 12. I have a thought today. It comes in the area of a question, which one are you? The question is, which one are you? When I walk through this, you're going to realize I'm going to ask you this. Are you a friend? Are you a spectator? Or are you just a... Uh, Let's call it a student of the law, self-righteous. Which, which one are you? The message will expose that in all of our lives. I want to talk to you first about the word crisis. A crisis is a difficult situation that needs serious attention. Um, year or so ago, was it last year, we went through a crisis when the weather got cold here and pipes started bursting. And you could just sit there in, the, in your bursted piped house and say, you know what, nothing's really going on. But what you don't realize is your sheetrock's falling in, your walls are becoming saturated, your floors are filling up, and if you don't shut it off, you're in trouble. Everybody moved during that crisis. It, 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 it affected this area. Matter of fact, it affected the whole South. Was that last year? Wow, oh, man, time goes by. Okay, crazy time, man. And all the pipe, it was a crisis for us. And, and crisis comes in different sizes and shapes. But to me, as I did the funeral, this really hit me. Do you really believe that people that who do not know Jesus are going to hell? And if you believe that people that don't know Jesus are going to hell, then uh, if you believe that, then somehow you need to understand there's a crisis. Now, if you don't believe that knowing Jesus, you can just get to heaven no matter what, then I don't even know why you're in this church. Because the truth of the matter is, the truth of the Word of God is, it teaches us there is a hell. Amen. Whether you call it Hades or Sheol or, or, or hell or Gehenna or, or whatever it is you call it, the lake of fire, the Bible says all that be thrown into the lake of fire. And, and we're, you know, we, we really digress with the word hell, don't we? I, I've heard it my whole life. That's funny as hell. Do you realize that's not funny? It's not funny to tell somebody that's funny as hell. Hell is not funny. Amen. We, we, we used to, well, that was one hell of a good fight. No, it wasn't. It was not. See, these are the, this is how I was brought up listening to stuff like this. Uh, scared the hell out of him. No, he didn't. He's still the same old rascal he was. It didn't scare nothing out of him, you know. It, it didn't change his life at all, you know. Or they moved way up the way up the hill of the hill. Uh, what in hell's wrong now? Well, there's a lot in hell wrong right now. You know, we don't think when we talk. We we just echo what somebody else says or mimic what somebody else says. But but if I and you would consider hell a crisis, when reading out of Revelation chapter twenty verse twelve, Amen. It says, "And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were opened. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. You've heard me say it forever. What we do here." The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Doesn't matter if you're buried in your body, cremated, thrown into the sea, and become fish food. It doesn't matter. This, you're, you're still going to, your body's going to come back up. I'm telling you, God's going to put it all back together and give you a new body. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Let's hold on just a second. It says here that death and Hades, hell, gave up the dead. If you understand correctly theology, hell, from what I understand, is probably more of a holding place. Amen. It's a place that was created, of course, for Satan and the imps, but it's a holding place. It's a place you go after you, uh, after you die. I, if to us, there's a heaven that we go to, too. It almost seemed like the heaven you go to, then the kingdom when you go through, and hell, then the lake of fire. You follow where I'm going here? So it says he gave them up. The dead and what were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. So then they were cast into an eternal place, a permanent place. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life 
was thrown into the lake of fire. The disciples came to Jesus one time and said, hey, you know, I'm going to tell you, we lay hands on the sick and they recover and all this is happening. We're seeing miracles. And Jesus said, don't rejoice because you're able to do miracles. Rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. That you got your name down. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Luke 17, 26, Jesus said, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. In other words, when he comes again. People were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking and buying and selling, planting and building, just going on with life. But the day Lot left Sodom, Fire and sulfur rained down from the heavens and destroyed them all. And again, I, I, see mis, I see people misquote quite often that the reason Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed was because of the sin of homosexuality. That was just one thing that went on there. The, the big deal that happened, the reason God destroyed it, is because they were unconcerned and overfed. You want to talk about our nation? Unconcerned, overfed. Amen. We don't care. You know, we become apathetic. And when you get to this place, and that's what God is saying here, is that it's just you know, people eating and drinking, giving and marriage, just going through life. But they forgot that there's a hell out there, and it's hot, and people need to be reached. Amen. And if we don't reach them, who's going to reach them? Amen. And when we get there, and it needs to be a, almost a crisis in your spirit to understand this and to catch it. Uh, when, I, when I walk through Scripture, I realize who, you, the people that reached me were my friends. It was my friend. It was Bob and Randy that went after me. Amen. It, it wasn't the people that I fought with in high school. It was guys that loved me and thought of me as a friend. They went after me. I was a professional burger flipper at the Sonic restaurant, and they drove around it, and they would they had a, they'd hold up signs. You know, I don't know. I, I'm, I throw, this is hyperbole. Turn or burn. You know, just something like that. Just just trying to reach me. They would come in and, and buy a drink at the knowing I was back there, and I could hear them talking, and they would tell me about Jesus. They invited me to go to a concert on a Saturday night because I wouldn't go to church on a Sunday morning. I said I would do it. I mean, no, many people are going to tell you they're going to come to Muscle Car Sunday, but they already got an excuse in the back of their mind. And I had an excuse. I had a date with Becky Kennedy, and I was excited. She was a majorette and one fine-looking girl. Woo! I was. I mean, I've been working up to this moment, so I knew I had. But we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, te you know, a texting. We didn't have email, anything like that. So I I'm trying to get hold of her. She's trying to get hold of me, and somehow the phone system got jacked, and I didn't have the date. I knew she liked me. She bought me a Halloween card. A true story there. So, so here I am, ready to go, you know, to, on a date. I can't go on a date. And I already told the boys I'd go to a concert with them. I went on a Saturday night, November the 10th, 1979. And that was it. God changed my life. Never got to date. Just want to throw that out there. Amen. Never happened, but it's okay. I'm sure she went on and had better things in life, and my life changed for the good. Amen. It flipped around. But it was my friend's. They were after me. Friends are a powerful thing. The fellowship of friends. The word fellowship in the Greek is the word koinonia, from which we get the word communion. And when we have communion, it's about being around friends. John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Our connection is about the love we have. A friend loves at all times, and the good, and also during a crisis. Amen. As we come up toward this conference, and then we come up toward our, our muscle car Sunday, it's my friends that I'm after. I, I can invite strangers. Strangers, but they probably don't have anything common with me. But all of you still have friends. All of you still have acquaintances and connections in life. So this crisis is a difficult uh, situation, and it needs serious attention. I don't want my neighbors going to hell. I don't want people that I'm connected to. I, if I got to spend time, if you got to sit with me during a half a football game, you know, and me connect with you in that way, whatever it takes to make that connection is so important. You can't escape crisis. It's coming. You're, you say, well, not me, and your pipe's busted. Well, not me, and Harvey got you. Not me, and Imelda flooded you. Not me, and next thing you know, a family member passes or gets sick. Crisis, you can't get away from it. Amen. Many try to avoid it. They don't understand it. They think, if they're saved, if God loves me, amen, somehow it shouldn't happen to me. We act as if we ain't got no problems, ain't, got, ain't gonna have one, no, not us. Wrong. Remember, you know, the issue there is to, to catch that, that all of us at one time or another are gonna have a crisis. And I have found it's through the crisis is where God really works the best. 
That's when I need him the most. Can I get an amen? So which one are you? Friend, spectator in the house, self-righteous teacher of the law, amen, which were the Pentateuch or, or the law, the people that showed up in Mark chapter 2. It was a full house. The Bible says a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard Mark 2 right here, that he had come home. Jesus come home. So many gathered there was no room left, not even outside the door. He preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd. You know, whenever you try to make something happen and it doesn't happen, you, I mean, revival's going on. Great things are going on. Jesus preaching in the house. And these four guys go get a friend and bring him. He's paralytic. Uh, this week, uh, Pastor Joseph and I went to visit a guy who's passing away. He may have already passed by now. But he has Parkinson's. And as I saw him lay there, I knew this man as a police officer, a man that came to our church years ago. And, and his words to those around him was, I need to see Pastor Jerry. I need to talk with Pastor Jerry. And I need to... Uh, I need to make sure that I'm, you know, that this is a ready moment. I understand that. They, it grabs hold of you at the end of life. So we went in to visit with him and talk with him. And, uh, and a song, and they had a radio on, and I heard a song come on. And went, uh, it, it, it was a little bit unfamiliar to me, but, but it caught my ear. It, it was down in Alabama where they love Nick Saban. I don't know if you have heard that crazy song. Amen. But it had something to do with it, getting your daughter in the right place in life and your son out of jail. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all country loving people. Amen. So I heard that song, and I looked over at him, and I said, said, roll tide. He went, roll tide. And I thought, man, he's still miracle waiting right here. Amen. Uh, and I found out later he was from Alabama, uh, connected with Alabama. He had family there. So it, we had that moment. But now, when you see Parkinson's or when you see palsy, it's a shaking. It's, it's uh, you're unable to stop or control it. And, and, and here's this guy with that same feel. And he, the Bible, this was the crazy thing about the Bible. The Bible never says the man talked. Never said he said a word. But he had friends who loved him that grabbed up the corners of his bed and got him back to the house but couldn't get him in. And what broke my heart is everybody's in there. Even the preachers are in the house, but nobody's willing to back out to help this guy in. Nobody's willing to park cars to let this guy come into the service. Nobody's willing to cook meat to let this guy come into the service. Nobody's willing to, to, to serve and, and greet to let this guy come into service. they all hanging out in the house. And at that moment, th this thing goes down where they realize they are in a place of being set back. Everybody know what a setback is? Again, it happened to you when, when the storm hit. Amen. It happens all our life. It means to slow the progress of purpose, to hinder or delay. There are different kinds of setbacks. There's small ones and large ones. There are degrees of setbacks. Amen. Uh, the cost of a setback. Some are small. Some cost a lot of money to fix. There is a diversity of causes. Amen. As it relates to set, setbacks, your health can be a setback. Economy can be a setback. The choices we make can be a setback. But their investment pushed them on. Somehow, they felt like they had something invested in this guy. And I've talked a lot about investments because it means a lot to me. You, you invest, relationships are about investment. You know that? It's like a bank. You invest in somebody, invest in somebody, invest in somebody. But every now and then, you've got to take a withdrawal. But if you don't invest and you keep taking withdrawal and withdrawal and you keep using people over and over without investing in their lives, then you have a bankruptcy. And that's what happens in relationships. They get in trouble. That's what happens in churches and businesses. We, we, instead of investing, we, we're pulling out. And when we pull out without investing, amen, again, then there's bankruptcy that's going to take place. So here we re realize, and some people believe this is Simon Peter's home. I do not know. If so, it reminds me of my house. You never know who's coming through the door. I mean, yeah, that door gets knocked. Last night I heard of somebody knock on the door. And I, I mean, I'm in a, in a mode sometimes where I jump up real quick because I can't see who's at the door. Dogs are barking. Next thing I know, JJ's at the door with a bag of potato chips for Pastor Paul. Paul, come on, Jesus. Amen. Some, sometimes you open the door and it's a good thing. Can I get an amen? Amen. Some would have said, you know, if it's God's will, if it's God's will, there would have been room for that man to get in the house and get a seat. 
It could have been the will of the Lord. His friend said, you know, we done brought this man way too far to turn around now, and we're tired. There are times you've got to make things happen. You've got to just say, scoot over, amen, or you've got to crawl up on the roof. Can I get an amen? Now, Christ has said, I've something invested in this miracle. That's my friend. I've prayed for him. I've fasted for him. I've gave for him. I've endured hard days with him and long nights. You ain't going to talk me out of this. I ain't turning around and leaving with him. I've got to get him to this place where Jesus is. You're not looking at my arrival. You're looking at the beginning of a destiny. They had resolved, amen, and Jesus honored their faith. Jesus said this in Matthew 2, 5, when, he, when Jesus saw their faith, your faith can be the healing, progression, miracle, salvation of somebody else's life because you had faith for them. Randy and Bubba had faith for me. They believed that if they got me in the right place where Jesus was, amen, that my life would change. So they believed, and they got me there. They got me to that, uh, that, that the, I call it, it was a concert, a bunch of long hairs, amen, in a church. And I, I didn't know anything about that. All I knew was this kind of stuff right here in churches, you know. So I got to the church, and, man, they, they cranked up that music. And I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm going, my God in heaven, what is going on? This is a rock concert in a, in a, in a church, amen, in Cherry Hill in Florence, Alabama. And here I am in there, and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost comes over me. I felt the presence of God, and I let go of a pew, and I walked forward. What did the preacher say when you were there? I have no idea. All I know is by the time I got back out to my 72 charger, God had touched my heart, and I knew I, a decision had been made. My gate had been set, and I was going to serve Jesus the rest of my life. And as that dog began to fight inside me, and that dead man rose up. I shoved in Nazareth, hair of the dog. Now you messing with a SOB. Was playing as loud as it could in my six by nine Jensen's in the back window. I lit up a Viceroy cigarette because I couldn't find no Marlboros. I hot boxed that thing down and lit off another cigarette with it. The fight was on inside me, man. I mean, I was struggling. I go, you going to serve God or not? You going to serve God or not? And I remember I took them cigarettes and I threw them out the window. I yanked that hair of the dog out right there. And I said, that's it. I'm going to serve God now. I went home and watched what I did. I took a knife to every one of my LPs. I had a stack about like that. I'm talking some of it was good stuff too. <laughs> Amen. But I couldn't listen to that music no more. I cut that music up and I pushed it aside. Now, Pastor, you listen to that stuff now? You know I do. Muscle Car Sunday's all about that music now. Amen. But I learned how to handle it. I didn't let it on me. I was going to use it. Amen. So the, my, the shift went on in my life. And oftentimes when you get born again, you go, what? over to one side. Amen. You get out of balance. The pendulum will swing over here. And, and then it'll come back. And then you get a little bit crazy. You think you almost backslid. And then you got eventually in life, you got to get back here in the middle. Can I get an amen? Get a little more balance in your life. These four guys, oh man, they, they, they amazed me. Jesus just kept on teaching and they got up on the roof of that building. Now, again, I can't prove, you can't disprove that this is Peter's house, but it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me because Peter later in life, Jesus looked at him after the people uh, accused him when he said, unless you drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you have no part with me. Jesus said that. Some of his disciples thought he was being cannibalistic and they left him. They thought he lost his mind. So Jesus looked at the disciples, his disciples, and he said, are y'all going to leave me too? Good question. Are you going to leave me too? I've invested in you. You've seen the miracles. We've walked on water together. You've seen the lepers healed. You've seen the dead raised. Are you going to leave me too? And Peter looked at Jesus, and, he, and I love the statement. He said, where else do we have to go? You have the words to eternal life. Amen. You've touched my life. You've turned me around. I don't have nowhere else to go. And by the way, you healed my mother-in-law, so I can't go back home there. Come on, Jesus. Amen. And then you turned around and let them tear my roof off my house. I ain't even got a house to go back to. So seriously, Jesus, where else do I have to go? I'm kind of stuck with you. Sometimes God will hem you in. Yeah. Amen. He'll make things just a little bit difficult to make sure you're going to serve him. Can I get an amen? Amen. So, yeah, again, they had to overcome something. I've said this forever. You don't know you're an overcomer until you got something to come over. Now they got something to come over. So here they go, amen, they get up on top. You know, some people give up over an ingrown toenail. I ain't going to church. Toe hurts today. You going to go to Walmart? <laughs> 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 
Yeah, yeah, you got a free barbecue waiting on you out there. Probably it ain't free. You've already paid for it this morning. Come on, get in, amen. Amen. So, so, but, but, but still, I'm still going to go to McDonald's. No, no, no. You got to back up your mind. I'm invested in this thing. Yeah, I said, yeah, you, you don't know you're an overcomer until you got something to come over. Can I get an amen? So crisis pushes you to your miracle moment. Our lives are a series of miracles from the crisis we've overcome. You, you all were taught this, hopefully, in school. I don't know what they teach now. But caterpillars becoming butterflies. You don't help a chick out of an egg because the chick was born with a beak. The beak helped him come out of egg to strengthen him. Some of you got to remind yourself you were born with a beak, amen, to come out of some tough places. Can I get an amen? So Christ is an indication you've outgrown your previous uh, level. Let me ask you ladies who have given birth. There comes a time when the crisis is going to hit, and you realize that which is in you has outgrown its home. And when it's outgrown its home, you are set in a crisis moment, and something's got to give. They call that a contraction. You'll feel it. You'll hear the women talk about it. Just had a contraction. They'll, they'll, they'll give you that. Huh? Huh? And they'll look down, and that baby in there kicking around, amen. That's your football player in there, yeah, or a boxer. You see the stomach going in and out, amen, or your little girl skating around, Whee! You know, just moving around. You know, you know. Right now, we got we got a problem. We got a contraction going on. So, and I've seen churches contract. I've seen people's lives contract. You have that moment. You're at a crisis point, and something's fixing to be birthed in your life. Amen. Something good is fixing to happen. It's an indicator. And then, when the infant is born, you, watch this. Now, an infant has a crisis of nourishment. It will cause that child to eat. When well, that baby won't eat, give that baby a little time. Let it go through a crisis. It won't be long. It's going to start eating. Amen. Then that child will have a crisis of communication, and they will learn to talk. And you'll hear that first word, no. <laughs> an infant, an infant has a, a crisis of mobility, and it'll cause them to walk. They'll get tired of scooting around on their hands and knees. Next thing you know, they're up walking. And, oh, you just praise God, don't you? Oh, my baby learned to walk in eight months. That ain't smart. That ain't smart. Amen. Just keep shoving that kid to the ground till about a year, you know. Don't let that kid take off running. Because once they start, it's, it's on like Donkey Kong. Amen. But it's a crisis that moves into that. See, see, then the motion causes emotion inside of all of us. Our love for people must be greater than the fear that attempts to stop us. There's a hell to avoid, and there's a heaven to gain. If not you, then who? If not now, then when? Tear the roof off that thing, man. Hallelujah. And, begin, and they begin to do that they began and again was it was it mud was it sod was it shingles i don't know but they begin to rip the roof off this thing and as they're lit doing it they create a hole and then the hole got bigger and bigger and jesus the bible says is still teaching he ain't quit talking amen and, and it, being at that funeral i can imagine when you have a disruption like that you want it everybody's attention gets drawn to it after the hole got so big jesus had to quit talking and realize now the focus is on him because they lowered him through the roof they dropped him down in now again dropped him down into the room where jesus was now if you're anywhere near him you got to get out of the way or they're going to drop that dude on you the bible don't say what he weighed but i got a feeling it would have still hurt so they begin to lower him down and the issue for us is that we got to tear the roof off we got to take shingles off. We got to say to ourselves, you know, I, I, if I got to tear off a shingle of fear, of hate, of prejudice, of laziness, of apathy, of competition, whatever it is, I got to take this roof off, man, because that man, that woman needs Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to do everything I can to get them there. So here, here's what I love. This guy, old Shaky Pete, got more than he showed up for. This is the amazing part of the story. And again, I'm going to ask the question, which one are you, friend, spectator, in the house, or self-righteous teacher? Matthew 2, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I don't want to be offensive here, but I can tell you that most of us, when we come to God, uh, even if you don't know Jesus, it ain't about salvation at the moment. It's about healing. We want to be healed. 
We want the pain to stop. We want our emotions fixed. We want our physical taken care of. So when he looks at him, he says, son, your sins are forgiven you. Well, hold on. Did we just tear this roof off the sucker? Lower him all the way down on the floor to hear Jesus say, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, at that moment, you, we, you and I need to realize something. That's plenty. If I get that, then I'm good. Come on. Amen. Because this body going to get healed when it transforms and goes through. You know, your body's going to go through crisis. Before you leave this planet, this body's going to go through a crisis moment, and you'll transition out of here. Amen. From here to your new body. So when he saw their faith. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there, and they thought to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Man, how much do I love religious people? You know, I mean, Jesus, you're trying to put him in a box. You're trying to make him say, you know, the only way that you're going to be, be saved is to be dunked in water. You know, uh, what does it say? There's power in the tub, power in the tub. No, no, no. There's power in the blood. Oh. Hallelujah. The only way you can be saved, talk in tongues. The only way you can be saved is do great works. The only way you can be saved is send your money toward Springfield or Cleveland, uh, Tennessee. Amen. The only way you can be saved is to go to a, a mosque over in, 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 uh, overseas in, in, in the east, Israel or one of them places. The only way you can be saved. No, no, no. He made it easy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. What he told the jailer. Amen. Uh, and I, I do believe in repent. I do believe in being baptized. But all those things, repentance is what saved me. When I decided, Jesus, I want you as my Savior. I accept you as my, my king. Amen. That's, how, that's what saved me. Did I get baptized? Yeah, I got baptized. Did I get filled with the Holy Ghost? Yeah, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. But the problem is I leak. I never had anybody tell me they are full of the Holy Ghost that didn't leak. We always leak. Amen. <laughs> we, I'm serious. Get out on the highway. You're leaking. <laughs> Deal with the former. You're leaking. Amen. Deal with your cheering. You're leaking. You constantly be refilled. Amen. Ask God to fill me again. Amen. Does that mean get tongue? Is anybody talking in tongues? It's about to ask God to fill you with love, hope, peace, long suffering, gentleness, meekness. Amen. Fill me with the, fill me with the fruits again, Lord. Remind me what, what was good about that. Okay, get back over on here. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that, was, that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. Not what they were saying, what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, what if God exposed what we were thinking in our hearts all the time? What if, you know, with many of us, we hide uh, what's in our heart because we've learned how to bite our tongue. We've not said it out loud, not to a spouse, a friend, or anyone else. But Jesus looked at it, which tells me this. If he could look at the religious leaders sitting in the room and knew what they were thinking, then he looked down at a man that did not ask for forgiveness and knew what he was thinking. You follow me? So here's a man that could not speak. He's mute. He's not saying nothing. And Jesus said, Ah, again, I can't prove this. You can't disprove it. But I think I might have just proved it with what he was thinking with the religious people. He looked down at him and said, I know what he's thinking. He's thinking, uh, you know, what I really want is you. What I really want is to be forgiven. See, I don't know what it was that caused him to be paralyzed. The Bible don't say. The Bible doesn't tell us his, his name. Amen. So we don't know what happened. But he looked down at him and said, son, your sins are forgiven. He knows what we're thinking. Amen. And at that moment, he looks at the religious guys and says, you know what? I know what y'all thinking. Y'all thinking, amen, why, who does this guy think that he is uh, to forgive sins? He thinks he's God. Immediately, Jesus knew in the spirit what, what, what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take up your mad walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. <laughs> he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, go home. He got up, took his bed, Walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everybody, and they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. 
Now, what I'm reading is, I'm thinking to myself, at this crisis moment, again, a difficult situation that needs some attention, Jesus looked at a man who was crippled, a man who was a paralytic, a man who was not talking, and he said to him, son, when Jesus talked to gender, he knew who they really were. When he saw a man, this man, he called him son. When a lady touched the hem of his garment, he called her daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. And she's cleansed of the blood disease she had. This young man, he says, son, son. There's one thing that I realize in life, the older I get, is this father hurt that we go through where we realize we need a dad. And when we as dads realize we have failed our children and our grandkids and generations in the past. And to be able to hear Jesus call him son, take up your mat. He told him, go home. Well, hold on. I'm a paralytic. Do you understand as a paralytic, they probably left him outside the city. He was a man that they threw money on his mat in order to make it. Somebody was feeding him. Somebody was taking care of him. These four guys, they, they, the Bible don't say it was his brothers and his dad that brought him. It was four friends that brought him and lowered him down through the roof. But Jesus looked at him and said, go home, son. So when he went home, watch what happened. Not only is he healed, but he has an identity. See, my identity is I am a son of God. Amen. He just made me his. He called me son. Amen. Now, I'm very careful with that word. I don't call the guys that I work with sons. Amen. I don't do this. You know, I don't tell people in the church, I'm your daddy and y'all my sons and daughters. I've heard that preached in churches all over the place. If you consider me a father figure, I appreciate it, but I ain't paying for your tuition. I probably won't even buy you anything from Burger King. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. But I'm going to love you and do the best I can. I don't flow down that vein. I understand it biblically, but I don't have to stand up here and tell you, you better buy me something because I'm your daddy. I don't even go down that route. I saw a preacher preach that. Got himself in a whole lot of trouble. Mad at his church because they didn't buy him a Modeva watch. I think I mentioned that last week, didn't I? I got to remember that. I'm having a little bit of skips here. Uh, but, but the word son revealed the real need. Relationship. The word daughter reveals the real need. Our generation today needs somebody to say son and daughter. They need to have that connection of relationship and their family. Why is it so screwed up? Because mamas and daddies are struggling being mamas and daddies. Amen. That's why, I'm, you know, I may not be the perfect dad, but I can show sure point you toward one. I can tell you about the one that know, they can call you son and daughter forever. Amen. And you'll be connected with him. I can see this moment when he went home, he got his identity back. Can you see him walking home? Can you see him toting his mat? Can you see him in his legs? And, you know, when they start working again, He's not shaking no more. And he's thinking to himself, he called me son. He called me son. I didn't hear him call Peter son, Thomas son. He didn't call any of them preachers there, any spectators. He called me son. Now, I can't, I got, it, this, this is like a movie in my head. I see four guys still on the roof. Huh? And Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven. The guys just smile at one another. Boy, ain't that good? Hallelujah. Our faith, hold on, our faith healed him. Our faith saved him. Well, hold on. You, you're saved by grace through faith. You're saved by grace, book of Ephesians, saved by grace through faith. So these four guys had already been saved. These four guys had to must have first come in contact with Jesus somewhere down the road. They must have witnessed uh, a muscle car Sunday, a revival, amen, a conference. They must have been in a meeting. Maybe, maybe Jesus was preaching on the Sea of Galilee, and Peter pulled up fish into the boat, and they witnessed it. And by faith... They became the sons of God. And now that they got faith, they went after one of their buddies. And they brought him to the house. And they tore off the roof because they know what it means to live by faith. Amen. In the grace of God. And my friend needs what we got. I can't convince you, son, but if I can get you in his presence, I promise you he'll change your life. And they lowered this young man down. 
And by faith, their faith, he got saved. You don't give up on your kids. It's your faith that's going to save them. You don't give up on your friends. It could be your faith that saves them. Amen. They're not going to heaven because you are saved. They're going to heaven because you refuse to realize we're in a crisis. I'm either a friend, family, either I'm a spectator, or I'm just a religious teacher. Ain't one nobody. Just want to stand on my little theology and tell everybody this, this is how I believe. And if you don't believe my way, you ain't getting to heaven. Well, you narrow, you narrow-minded idiot. He got more than he came for. He got saved. He got healed. Sometimes I think, Pastor Joseph, we need to be careful how we identify people. At this moment, he was a paralytic. After Jesus touched him, saved him, he was son. Many times we identify people based on a situation in their life, don't we? Yeah, that's old, that's old alcoholic Annie. That's old hop along Hank. We just call people by what we identify them with their problems. That's old druggy Doug. But then you get touched and you become son of God. Don't identify me with my past or my failures. Amen. God is taking that away. As Pastor Joseph plays, I want to read you something. Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he'll sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. You think this pomp and circumstance when Queen Elizabeth died and something? You wait till we stand before the king and he's on his glorious throne. He will put the sheep on his right and goats on his left. Everybody understand that's just speaking of righteous and unrighteous. When the, then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father. If, if God called you son or daughter, that's your daddy. Take your inheritance. Oh, my God. Please, why do we need an inheritance? God, you got something special for your children. You got something planned for us. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. <clears throat> I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. And you invited me in to watch half of the football game. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison. You came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty, and give you something to drink. When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, hell. Prepared for the devil and his angels. It's the lake of fire. For I was hungry, and he gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and he gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes? or sick, or in person, or in prison, and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Boy, that's sobering, isn't it? It's a reminder 
And what we do here matters. Their heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord, let a spirit of repentance fall upon your people. Let us turn from a life of being overfed and underconcerned. Let us turn from a life of just being comfortable and making it all about us. So it causes us a, a few hours of, of work, a few hours of pressing in. And not just this coming Sunday, but for the rest of our lives. Remind us, Lord, that our faith is important. It's our faith that saved us. It's our faith that will reach toward others when he saw their faith. God, I thank you for saving the people in this house and giving us faith to believe that you're going to do mighty things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I didn't go to 11 o'clock, but I'm pert near at 10. That means I'll have to drive fast to get to where I'm going. Amen. So we're going to make this quick. If I get our servant leaders to come back up. Again, I explained to you the difference in the tithe and the offering. Amen. So you understand right now it's our time to tithe. Give toward this house to take care of all of our the missions and shoot whatever else we got to deal with. Uh, take care of fuel call. Just You know, the issue bottom line about giving is honoring God. Amen. It just honors God. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sad sometimes that some people think this is a, a detriment in the body. God never changed it. He kept it at 10%, never upped it, never went up. He said, this is it. It's equal sacrifice, not equal giving. Some can give more, some can't, but it's just where we're at in life. Pastor David, I'll, I'll go ahead and share this. This today at 3 o'clock. If you can come out, if you're involved in uh, Muscle Car Sunday in any shape, form, fashion of leadership, amen, you want to come out and, and maybe even say, Pastor, I, I didn't know where to sign up. I just need to know what to do now. Uh, some people do that to us all the time. The sign-ups are in the back, and there's a lot of empty spaces. But it, anxiety happens to me is when people come up and say, Pastor, I'll do whatever you ask, and I, I'll mention it to them, but they never sign up, and I forget who they were. So I don't know who it is that's going to help park cars. Amen. But that's, that's a big deal out at the, at the ranch. Who's going to separate people together? Who's going to serve the food? Amen. With our kitchen staff. And here's the great thing. Most of the things that we're going to do start before or after. And you'll have time to enjoy the service and the fellowship and the vehicles. And I was at a car show uh, Friday night. And, and guys were already excited. They said, oh, yeah, I already know about it. I'm going to be out there, Pastor. I met new people that had never heard of us and got to invite them out. They were all excited. And, and I don't know what it is about that old purple car of mine. I pull up, and it's like a big old hook. You know, I'm kind of used to it. They're not. But when I tell people the story that the former owner's in the back seat, whoo, it changes the whole paradigm at that moment. And they understand that that guy, his ashes in the back seat, but his new body's in heaven. Amen. Wow. So that, those are powerful things that we get to use. Good to have you here, darling. Amen. As we give today, we believe in God for? More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off. <coughs> Debts demolished, royalties received, favor, and success to the kingdom. Pastor David, I will have you come up here and close us in prayer, if you would, sir. Uh, you see the announcements on the overhead and uh, so today at 3, out at the ranch, we'll gather. So I'll give you time to grab something to eat. Come on out and hang out with me a little bit. And we just want to make sure we got this thing buttoned up and we're ready. Also, T-shirt sales are in the back in, the, uh, in our uh, Forge slash uh, Fellowship Hall. Amen. And then what else was I thinking? Oh, yeah, next Saturday, 8 o'clock breakfast. It's family breakfast. Come on out, have breakfast with us out at the ranch. In two or three hours, we'll be done. Setting up chairs, setting up the property, getting all everything set in such a way that we're ready for the for the car show. It's already looking good. We're gonna stay on it this week, uh, the staff and I, and uh, we'll we'll make sure that it's gonna be because many hands make what light work. Amen. Amen. Give it up for your pastor.